Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. So I wanted to talk to you today about having faith in Jesus. With this coronavirus stuff going on, it seems like with an empty church, some people don't have any faith. Personal opinion, not, not official thing, but as many of you know, I work at the VA hospital and I work in the ICU. I'm not a doctor or a nurse, I'm just a housekeeper. I go in, I clean and sanitize the rooms after the patient leaves so that the next patient comes in, doesn't get what the last patient had, like MRSA or C. diff or coronavirus. So I enjoy this. It's not a hard job, and it's a good job to make sure so I can make sure I'm doing something decent for these people. But during that time, uh, this coronavirus thing that's going on, the hospital has made some special adaptations things. They've set aside one they set aside one section of floor two for just corona patients so that it could they could be isolated and not be in contact with others they also expanded the icu from we're on the third floor they expanded it down to the second floor and was supposed to have taken care of that as well but they have re since returned to their original duties what their rooms were designed for because we did not have the amount of corona patients that everybody said we were going to have. In fact, during the time I was working there, we've only had like three, maybe four, mostly two at a time. And it hasn't been as bad as they have been talking about on TV and everything. So they put these floor two back to where they're supposed to be in these rooms. They put them back to be offices like they were supposed to be. And so we don't have all this extra space. But in ICU, everyone that comes in is treated as if they have the coronavirus until they get the test or they find out that they don't. I mean, it's talked about like it's really bad, but most of us, almost all of us, there's a couple of people who are kind of germaphobic. When we're in ICU, we don't wear our masks. There's a protocol in the hospital to you know, wear your mask all the time, you're in a hospital. When we get to ICU, we take our masks off because we don't think it's that dangerous. Of course, when I go in, and I go in every day to clean these rooms and take out the trash, I, I'm in these coronavirus rooms every day. And of course, I wear the proper PPE, the stuff that keeps me, the little headgear that keeps me from breathing their air, and things like that but I'm really not worried about that much about getting it. Well, um, have been there. Some of them, there have been a few of them who have died. Not very many. From all the time I've been there, I don't know, four or five people have died from it. But the others have not died. And some of the things I've noticed about it, those who have died have had previous conditions like diabetes, COPD, um, extreme obesity, and other things like this, heart disease, you know, something that's had made them weaker before they even caught this disease. I was in one room one day taking out the trash, and I had glanced over to see the patient, and this guy was swollen. I mean, he was swollen like a balloon. You could hardly tell he was a human being with his face. His hands, fingers were like sausages, I mean, just swollen. I thought, oh man, this guy must be in terrible pain. And as I was taking trash out, an alarm went off, and a nurse went over to check the alarm, and I heard her say, oh no. You could tell by the, the sound of her voice that this guy, something was bad. She says, oh no. So I knew something was wrong. As a matter of fact, he had just died. So I left the room quickly and got out of there because I knew there would be a bunch of people coming in there trying to revive him. This time they didn't, didn't succeed. But uh, there was one guy who had been in the hospital, different guy, who had been in there for six weeks and he finally passed. And 
all this time, six weeks, his family had not been able to come and visit him or see him or just get messages from the nurses how he's been doing. It must have been really, really bad for them to have lost him and not have been able to see him. Those who uh, survived, like I say, have had previous illnesses like uh, diabetes, COPD, some heart trouble. And most of these diseases is from a lifestyle that we all know is not the best thing our, for our bodies, even though some of us are not uh, practicing it. But we know, we have been taught, we have been shown that it's best. Even the unbelieving world out there knows that there are things that you can do to make you healthy. And this is one of the reasons why some of these people are dying, because they have not had a healthy lifestyle. They have hurt themselves. In the very beginning of this outbreak, Judy and I listened to Dr. Uh, Neil Nedley and Dr. and uh, Pastor Doug Batchelor on the on the TV. They had a special thing about the coronavirus. We wanted to find out because we didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> and Dr. Nedley, they talked about all these things that's going to happen and everything. And he said the best thing we could do was to have a strong immune system. He said that we should be on a uh, plant-based diet, in which we already were, mostly. I mean, we are not perfect in our diet, as everybody isn't. And we must strengthen our immune system. And they, he suggested we take supplements like this. NAC, never heard of it before, but it's a good thing. It helps support uh, liver and lung function, especially lung function. So to take vitamin zinc or I guess this is a mineral, mineral zinc, which kills coronavirus on contact, and to uh, take uh, vitamin D3, which is good, the best thing for us, because most of us are lacking in that, whether, even though we're in Arizona, we're very lacking in it. We were, We, we took these things, you know, plus the other vitamins we had already been taking. We were not co too concerned because, you know, we were on a plant-based diet already, and like things like the flu, we never got the flu, and if we did, it was just a very light case. And, and we were fairly healthy con considering that we were, you know, in our older, because some of that stuff is not so good for the older folks. Many people I have heard have been asking if this virus is one of the seven last plagues. I don't think it's so because of many reasons, which I won't go into tonight, today. But God said there are going to be plagues and that his people won't be affected to them, by them. Psalms 91 verse 1 says, A thousand shall fall by thy side and ten thousand by thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. And I'm asking, why won't it come near you? Is it because God's people are healthier and obey his suggestions, his commands about eating correctly because they eat right and they take care of their bodies because they know they are bought with a price? First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, for you are bought with a price, therefore glory God in your body and in spirit, which both of them are God's. I do see a lot of people who are afraid of this virus, and sometimes it's rightly so. But I'm talking about kind of an unnatural fear. I mean, a fear that makes them yell at people for not wearing their mask in the store and stuff like that. And what surprised me most are the Christians who are, have this fear. And it seems to me that's kind of a, a lack of faith in God. That's just me. That it is a lack of faith in God. All the devotions that I have been reading since this thing started, has all, almost all of them have seemed to be encouraging me to trust God, have faith in him, and do well and obey him. And I'd like to share one of them that I had. It's in the, faith, in the book, The Faith I Live By. 
It quotes uh, Joshua 1, 9, I have not, have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be you dismayed, for the Lord your God is with thee wherever you go. And continues on, some always look at the objectionable and the discouraging features, and therefore discouragement overtakes them. They forget that the heavenly universe is waiting to make them agencies of blessings to the world. And the Lord Jesus is, never, is a never-failing storehouse from which human beings may draw strength and courage. There is no need for despondency and apprehension. The time will come when the shadow of Satan, I should let me correct that, the time will never come when the shadow of Satan will not be cast toward your pathway. Thus the enemy seeks to hide the sun of righteousness from you, but our faith should pierce, pierce through that shadow. Hope and courage are essential to perfect service for God. These are the fruit of faith. Despondency is sinful and unreasonable. God is able and willing more abundantly to bestow upon his servants the strength they need for test and trial. That's sickness too. In the darkest days, when appearances seem forbidding, fear not, have faith in God. Christ did not fear, neither was he discouraged, and his followers are to manifest the same enduring nature. They are to despair of nothing and hope for everything. With the golden chain of his matchless love, Christ has bound them to the throne of God. And I want to say to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, don't be afraid of this virus. God is in charge of this thing as well. Nothing is out of his control. You have nothing to fear except the disobedience to be, you have nothing ex to fear except you be disobedient and forget how God has worked in your life before. Have faith. Have faith in our Lord God. And in closing, I'd like to share an old Arab say, saying says, trust in God, but tie up your horse, or your camel. They had camels. Trust in God, but tie up your camels. But I like to say, wash your hands, but trust in God. That's the most important. He's the pure water. He's the soap. He's the cleansing tide that will cleanse away all this physical stuff. Trust in God in all your, all your dealings. Shall we bow our heads? Our Father in heaven, we praise your wonderful name and we thank you for that golden chain that ties us to the throne of God. We thank you for Jesus who came and showed us courage and faith and strength to do what's right. Bless us, Father, to keep our eyes on Jesus. Help us not to see these things of the world, but to look up, to look up to our Lord and our Savior who is the strength of our lives and will soon come again. Bless us, we ask, as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, Dr. Edelman is going to have our uh, Sabbath school lesson. Thank you. pass out the quarterlies for the new quarter coming up and Barbara will have those and she'll pass those out. Is that the future one? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, this whole quarter, we have been studying about the scripture, and we continue to set that study this week and next week, and then the quarter will be over.
But before we begin studying his word, let's just ask that the Spirit of God be present. Loving Father, we ask that the Spirit of God will come into our home, into our lives, and into this church, and into each one of us. That as we study your word, that we will have righteous discernment and heavenly wisdom and knowledge and understanding. It was given by inspiration, and the Holy Spirit moved upon men of old. And now we have the Word of God that we can study. What a great privilege we have. So be here present, we pray, as we study this Sabbath school lesson this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can you hear me back here? Uh -huh. Yep. <clears throat> okay, the, the title of the lesson this week is The Bible and Prophecy. Anyone want to tell me what great prophecies are in the Bible? Well, we have, as Adventists, we have five pillars of faith. And we know what the first two are because our name is in the pillars of faith. Seventh-day Sabbath and the soon coming of Christ. And the other pillars of faith is to believe in the Bible as the sure word of God. And he We'll be studying about these pillars of faith as we open this uh, lesson this morning. So if you have your quarterly with you, turn to Sunday's part of the lesson. If you have any question or you want to add any thought, please do so. In Sunday's part of the lesson, it describes historism and, pra and prophecy. What is, there are different types of people do not understand that there is different types of understanding. Some believe in history, that it, just like it says, others think that it's a different thing, goes around. And they do not realize that in apocalyptic prophecy that a day represents one whole year. And there's a couple of texts that tell us that in the Bible. Ezra 4, 6, and Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel it says each day for a year. When the children of Israel disobeyed God and they wanted Moses and God wanted to lead them into the promised land from Mount Sinai. And he sent out a group of spies to spy out the land. And it's too bad that only two of them really had faith enough to do it. They said, oh, we can't do that. There's giants in their land. It is fortified. We can't do it. And because they took that thought upon themselves, not one of them except Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, and I suppose their family, went into the promised land. The ones that who left Egypt. Over 600,000 people died in the wilderness. And he said, for every day that the spies were in the land, that's going to be a year before we get to the promised land. And every one of them died except Joshua and his family and Caleb and his family. Even Moses who had led them out, couldn't go in because why could he not go in? Here he was a man of God. He had been on Mount Sinai. 
He had been with him for 40 days up in the mountain. How come he couldn't go away? He struck the rocks. He lost his temper. He lost his temper. He struck the rock. And what did God tell him to do? Speak. God is very specific about sin. The children of Israel, not only the children of Israel, but in the beginning, Adam and Eve had a test. Very specific. You can eat anything you want, but you see that tree right there? It's called the tree of good and evil. Of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that tree. Because the minute that you do, you start dying. And in fact, they sent the whole, two holy angels into the garden with gleaming swords protecting the tree of life. Because if they would have eaten that, they would have had eternal life. We're going to eat of that tree. One of these days. That fruit of that tree changes every month. Twelve months out of the year, I don't know what's on it, but I'm sure apples for sure. I love that. Peaches. Plums. Apricots. I don't know what they are, but they change every month. Well, they've got to change, and as soon as you pick an apple or a fruit off of that tree, what happened? Another one more. It got to. There's millions of people who will be in heaven. The 144,000, as you know, is a symbolic number that make up the saints of God. I'm looking forward to that day. I know you are too. That's why we're here in this church today, to worship our Creator. Because He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Great things happen on the Sabbath. Healing takes place. There was a couple of blind men that came to Christ and they said, would you heal us so that we can see? And what did Christ ask those blind men? Do you really believe that I can do that? Oh yes, we do. Well, according to your belief, you may see. And we're told that they could see immediately. Does God really mean what he says? That he is actually coming again yes. to save us? Absolutely. He is coming again. Now, we don't know when. There was a group of Millerites. They thought it was going to be in 1844. William Miller had figured out, he was a, a, a farmer by nature, but he became a real Bible student. And he studied, studied, and studied. And finally the word came to him that he needed to give this message to everyone around him. And so he started being invited by pastors of different churches to come. And he gave his view on the end of the world, he thought. And he based it on Daniel 8, 14. And that's one of the last verses that we study in today's lesson. What does Daniel 8, 14 have to say? Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And he studied, and he studied, well, when does that begin? And when does it end? But that's just part of that prophecy. Within that prophecy, there is a 70-week part. 70 weeks. Well, if you, if you were thinking of little week, weeks, it would only be a, a little more than a year. But it ended up a day for a year to be 490 years. 
When did it start? Well, William Miller came up with the figure of 457. Where did he take that figure from? The Word of God. What book? Ezra 4, 6. And what does it say? In the certain year of Artaxerxes, he made a command <coughs> for the children of Israel to be released from their Babylonian captivity. And from that time, it began. And if you figure it out, it extends clear to 1844. William Miller thought it meant the world was coming to an end. And not only Will, William Miller, but a lot of the early Adventists. They had a disappointment. October 27, they had 22. gathered together for the coming of the Lord, and it didn't 22. happen. Oh, that must have been a terrible, terrible thing. What went wrong? The thing that went wrong was that it was not the coming of the Lord, it was the beginning of the investigative judgment. Well, why do they need a judgment? Well, they got to find out who really should belong and who shouldn't. Not everyone has chosen to be the child of God. And sin is not going to happen the second time. Once the earth is cleansed, once Christ returns and he saves the saints, they're going to judge the world. The first thousand years we're going to spend in heaven judging. How come my, my son didn't get that? How come my neighbor didn't get that? How come, how come, how come? People want to know why. And so the books, the Bible says the books are open and they re reveal every act that we have committed. I used to wonder how that could be. But now with a computer, they give you these little things that you can stick in it and it has hundreds of pages on it. And evidently, the Lord probably gives them the computer. He's the mastermind. He created everything. The Bible says everything that was made was made by him. John 1, 1 to 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And that he made all things. What a God we serve. Sovereign Lord of the universe. So let's go on here in our lesson. And we understand that the history that they're talking about is events in our history. In earth's history. Okay, it started in 457. Seventy weeks are determined upon my people. Who was his people? Israel. Israel. Who, were, who were the Israelites? The son of Jacob. Who was the son of Isaac? Who was the son of Abraham? And God had made a promise to Abraham that he would bless the whole world through the Messiah. And Christ came through the blood, down through the history of Abraham, down through the history of David. Christ was born. And included in that history is a couple of women. One was a prostitute. Amazing. Grace. Here she had given herself to the Lord. She had been a prostitute. Rahab. She had protected the spies when they came to spy out the land. What a wonderful God we serve.
Okay. This history that takes place. We say it started in 457. In 457, the Jewish nation was in captivity. They had been in captivity for 70 years. And Artaxerxes finally said, Cyrus, the Persian king, sent a group home. Another king sent a group home back to Palestine. But the decree to rebuild the city and to make it livable for all of them to go came from Artaxerxes, Longinus. And in the seventh year of his reign, he gave this decree. And we see the result. And it went for 70 weeks. When would that end? It started in 457 BC. When did the 70 weeks for the 490 years end? 34 AD. What in history took place in 34 AD? Peter or Stephen was stoned. But it said, the little part of it, the week there, that the Messiah would come. And when the, when the time was fulfilled, Christ, who sat on the throne right next to the Father, agreed to come down, take on human life. Can you imagine? He had the adoration of all the angels. He was co-ruler of the universe with the Father. He was God. We're told in Matthew, they gave him the name of Emmanuel, God with us. And he was God. He came down here and lived like a human being. And that date of birth for him was about 4 B.C. Herod was the king of Israel at that time. Herod was not a Jew. Who was Herod? He was an Edomite. Who was Edom? The descendants of who? Esau. Esau. Cain. And the Cain took his people and they moved and went to an area called Edom. Seth took his people. Cain had killed Abel. He was the original heir of God. But Cain had killed him. And Seth was born. And he was the father of, them, of the nation that was going to be the God's people. In 27 AD, Christ came to the throne. Who was the emperor of the world at that time? Pontus, not Pontus, Caesar Augustus was the ruler and the emperor of the world when Christ was born. But he had died. And when Christ came to the, to the river where John the Baptist was, he asked to be baptized. Oh, no, not. You need to baptize me. He says, that must be so that all will be filled. And we're told that as he came up out of the water, that the Holy Spirit came down and lit on him as a dove. And the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well. 27 A.D. 
Caesar, not Augustus, I'm trying to, Tiberius. Caesar Tiberius. In fact, they named the Sea of, of Galilee after him, and they called it the Sea of Tiberius. Donnie and I had the privilege of being on that sea and having a Sabbath school on a boat in the Sea of Galilee. Oh, we enjoyed that so much. It's part of history. That sea is a part of history, and that's what we're studying. History and prophecy. We have a beginning and we have an ending. And the ending was 34 for the 70 weeks. And the total 2300 day prophecy, the ending was 1844, October of 1844. And that was the ending when Christ moved from the holy place that he was ministering. After Christ went to heaven, he went to heaven 40 days after he was raised from the dead. He had met with his disciples a few times. And then he ascended to heaven. And during that time that he had been in heaven since his ascension, he had sent the Holy Spirit to the disciples. And they went and gave the message to the whole world in their lifetime. No TV, no radio, no airplanes. They walked. And they gave the message. Amazing. Amazing what happens when we give our lives to the Holy Spirit. And it comes finally up to 1844 when Christ moves from the holy place into the most holy place. If you want a, a, a description of it, read Daniel 7. It says the Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? God the Father. The Ancient of Days came. I like the description. It says his, his will. I don't know what his will are, but his will came. And then it says that Christ came and he was called and they, he became a part of this investigative judgment and is still a part of it. Even though it hasn't ended, it started in 1844. When does it end? It goes to the very end of time. When clobation closes, the judgment is over. We're told over within the book of Revelation that Christ stands up and he said, what? It is finished. What, when did he make that statement before? On the Son of the cross. It is finished. On the cross, what was finished? The plan of redemption. When he comes down, what's finished? The judgment is over, and Christ is coming to claim you and me and everyone that has given their life to him. Now there's a lot of people who have not decided to do that. And that's where we come in. We need to preach the message to the whole world so that they will have no excuse. Christ could have used angels to finish the work. And he does, their ministry and spirits. We're told in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 1. But he chose to use me and you and every person who takes upon his name Christ. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church is identified as that movement that began. We have the Spirit of Prophecy. That's another pillar of the church. I mentioned the Sabbath and I mentioned his Advent or coming and the spirit of prophecy. Any other made of the five of the five pillars, what are they? If you were huh? 
Huh? Sanctuary message? The sanctuary message? The sanctuary. No other church preaches the sanctuary. And what is the sanctuary? Everything that takes place in that sanctuary is based on what something that Christ has done. The lamb that is slain, he is that lamb. The peace offerings that are given, he is the peace. He said to his disciples, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives peace, but my peace. And if you want peace, you have to go to Christ to get it. He's the only one who can really do it. Okay, we, we, we've identified four. And the fifth one, what is the fifth one? Five pillars of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Absolutely, you got it. State of the dead. The devil said, here, to Eve. Did he really tell you that you would die if you make it? And here he is eating on this fruit. You won't die. You'll become like God. And he doesn't want you to eat it because then you won't eat him. And she fell for it. And Adam, you better. But he didn't want to lose it. And so he took an ale too. And the moment they ate it, they began to die. But the life force was so great that Adam lived how long? 930 years. 930 years. We get to be 80 and we think we are old. And we are. <laughs> it's nothing to compare to that first ten generations that came along after Adam. We had Seth, and we have on down the line. The seventh from Adam was Enoch. He lived 50, 350 years, and then he wasn't. Why? God took him. And then he, his son was, was Methuselah. He lives 969 years. He is recorded as the oldest man that has ever lived. But we're going to beat that. That will be nothing compared to eternity. And with no pain, no death, no tears. I suppose we will have some tears when we're going over the book of record and we're seeing why so and so is not here. We've got to have tears of for them, in my own mind, and that's probably true. But it says God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Great, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, we talked about the year and day principle. Anyone have any questions about what we've talked about so far? Yes. State of the day. What do you mean by state of the day? No, I'm very hard at hearing. What do you mean by state of the dead? The state of the dead. Some believe, people believe, that when you die, you go to heaven. Seventh-day Adventists believe that when you die, you go to your grave. And at the end of the judgment, when Christ comes again, then you are raised from the dead to go home with him forever. In other words, my spirit is not floating around in heaven if I die. You're, you're in the grave. Well, you know, I have some Jehovah Witness friends of mine, yes. and they believe that when you die, it's asleep. I know, well, that, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Christ calls it 
a sleep. When Nazareth died, he told his disciples, they had sent for Christ to come. Your good friend Lazarus is sick. He needs you. And so he fiddled around for a little while and didn't go. And Lazarus died. And he said to his disciples, we need to go see about Lazarus. Well, Lazarus is dead. I know. He is asleep. And we're going to wake him up. And when they went, it was commonly believed that if they were dead for three or four days, then they were dead. And Lazarus was had been, and Martha told him, oh, don't, he stinks. And he said, did not I tell you that if you believe in me that I am eternal life? Yes. And he said, remove the stone from the grave. And they, they removed the stone. And he had to mention Lazarus by name. Lazarus, come forth. I think if he hadn't, everyone could have come forth. That is what he is able to do. He is going to call every one of us. From, whether we're ashes, us and Jerome are ashes. And many of the martyrs are ashes. And some people today, even and still, cremate. If whether we're ashes or bones, we will come forth and we will know each other as we are known. If we have legs missing, those will be replaced. If we have an arm, any deformity will be replaced. And we will have time to grow up into the image that he intended for us to be. And that's 15 feet tall. I believe that. Christ has grown back up to his to the image of manhood. He still has human nature. And that is why we when we pray that we need to pray that the Spirit of God will bring Christ into our lives so that we can behold Him and beholding Him, we become changed into His likeness. Okay, let's go past the day in the principle. Thanks for the remark. But the one would identify in the little horn who is the little horn of Daniel 7? Remember, they give a, a, an image. All these ones that were formed, starting with Babylon, going to Medo Persia, going to uh, Greece, and then to Rome, and then after Rome, still Rome. But instead of being pagan Rome, it is papal Rome. So we have these different ind individual things. And what is papal Rome? He is a little horn that comes out. There was 10 tribes in Europe and he, with his people and followers, took over three of these tribes. And they formed what is called the papacy. And the papacy is the Pope of Rome and their doctrine. And he is the one who thinks he's changed everything. He only thinks it because God is in charge after all. And that's why God says in his commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
we have a tendency to forget, and the children of Israel had completely forgot the law of God after being in captivity in, in uh, Egypt. When they were there under Joseph, things went good because he was prime minister. But the Bible says that a pharaoh rose who knew not Joseph, and they became slaves. They helped build the pyramids. If you've ever been to Egypt, and, I, and we have, Dottie and I have, it's a real privilege to see those pyramids. They were built mainly by the children of Israel when they were slaves. And then we go on and we identify this little horn as the Pope. I know it's not very wise for people to think that way in today's world. President Reagan, when he was president, actually named an official minister to the Vatican. And it will be that way until the end of time. And the papacy will rule till the end of time. Now the, the Roman papacy that came into being actually started in 538 AD. And it ruled for time, times, and the dividing of time. How long is that? 1260 years. If it began in 538 and you add 1260 to it, what figure do you come up with? 1798. What happened in 1798? Napoleon, who was the emperor of France, sent his general, General Berthier, into Rome and he captured and made a prisoner of the Pope. So the papal power was in prison for a while. But we see as we study the book of Revelation, specifically Revelation 13, we see this animal that comes up out of the sea and it's a leopard. And this leopard has wings for rapidity, being able to travel rapidly. He has heads. And who is this leopard? It is the ruling power at the end of time. And who is that? The papacy. If you study chapter 13 of Revelation, you will see that. But it is not only the papacy, but who else is involved? The United States of America. How's that? It's, he's the land-like beast of Revelation 13. When the United States was formed, it was formed by people who were looking for religious freedom and religious liberty. Started out by just a few people on the Mayflower. And now there's over 350 million here in this country. Who's the other part of this trinity, the evil trinity, the devil? Lucifer, who defied God, and he wanted to become like God. He was not a happy camper when he was, when the earth was created and the, the council of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit decided to make, have a new creation. And they made a man. God said, let us make man after our image and our likeness. And he wasn't invited. Why should he be? 
He was the highest created being. He was not God. The Godhead decided this. And now we're living in the end of time. I have no idea when that's going to be. Well, I have an idea, but I could, I cannot give you a date. Because a year, thousand years in the sight of God is like how long? A day. One day. That's hard for us to understand. That's why we have to be ready for his immediate coming. All the prophecies have been fulfilled. What are we waiting for? God is so merciful. He wants to save as many people as possible. And so it's our job to be witnesses for him and to tell others of a soon coming Savior. I believe with all my heart that this Cornus virus that is going on right now is one of the signs of the end. Why do I believe that? Because in the book of Matthew, if you read the 24th and 25th chapter of Matthew, he gives signs of when the end will be. Wars and rumors of war. We've always had war. World War One, World War Two, Korean War, Vietnam War. We will always have it. Famine we will have. The Irish moved to the United States, many of them, because they had a famine and they lived off of potatoes. The Irish potato. Good food. <laughs> There's been famines. The children of Israel had famines and Jacob sent his sons to, to Egypt to get food for the family. And of course, the Lord knew what was coming. He provided Joseph to be the prime minister and they fed them and even brought his family down to Egypt. 71 peace people went down. And over 600,000 came 400 years later. Second bell, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what do I need to... I think I basically have covered everything. I just want to go over this little paragraph, and I've mentioned it already. It says, careful Bible study resulted in the five distinct pillars of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Sabbath, the second coming of the, the sanctuary, the state of the dead, and the spirit of prophecy. I don't know if I meant, did we mention the spirit of prophecy? That's the five. And then it goes on and says, The combination of these biblical doctrines with the three angels' messages. Where's the three angel messages found? Revelation 14. With the message are understood today to give the Seventh-day Adventist Church its message and identity. I hope that we realize we have the message. We have that identity, and I hope we do our job. Not only do I hope it, but I pray for it every day. Any questions anyone has? Okay, uh, sit down. But before I do, let's just close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you and for your word. Let us study your word. May the Spirit of God come into our lives and may he make us Christ-like in all that we do. And we are told in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And we're told in Colossians 1.27, we have this great hope, and that hope is Christ in us. 
the hope of the Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayer this morning. Bless us for the rest of this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Uh, I do apologize for the technical difficulties, um, but unfortunately, we're going to have to use our hymn books this morning um, because of the problems that we're having. So our first song for this morning is Hymn 476. Hymn 476. And we'll sing all four, I mean all stanzas. Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is Next hymn is 483, which is a couple of pages to your right. And we're going to sing all four stanzas. 483. It's back on. Um, I just wanted to say good morning to everyone. And um, I think we have a few visitors here. 
I just want to welcome you to our Tempe Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, next up is our morning announcements by the pastor, but I think he's still minute, fiddling around with his computer. <laughs> so I guess we can do one more hymn. Someone pick a hymn. Oh, here he comes. Send it off, that's why. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. You know, I'm still getting used to this new order of things for our, our worship service. And uh, of course, we are having some problems with the computer. So I'm going to do this by, uh, by hand. Uh, today's offering is for our local church budget. So um, the way our offerings are being done for the next uh, few weeks is um, I've been announcing this, but some of you may have not been here yet. We are not collecting the offerings with the offering plate. We're collecting them at the end of the service. And so your offerings that you give for the worship service, this also includes Lamb's offering, where the little kids would come and collect the offerings for children's ministries. We're not collecting that either. We're just trying to do our best for keep the social distancing and minimize handling of things. Um, I feel bad because, Kathy, I forgot my mask. <laughs> I completely forgot, and, uh, and I, hope, I thought we had extras, but we don't. So, um, and don't say, you can borrow my mask, Pastor, because that's, <laughs> that's not the way it works, right? <laughs> but um, anyway, so the offerings, the lamb's offering, uh, our regular uh, offerings and the tithes, and also Sabbath school offerings. We're collecting all of those at the end of the service. So it's a little more work on your part. You'll have to fill out a tithe envelope and put your money for Sabbath school offerings, for lamb's offering, the church budget, or whatever you want to give to, and your tithe. So we're announcing that at this point, so you can prepare um, by the end of the service. We'll collect those at the, at the end. You'll just drop them off at a plate. Um, our drive through offerings, we also, for those of you who are watching us live stream, um, we're having our drive through uh, tithe and offerings drop off from 12:30 to 1 but today is the last day correct daniel i think we discussed this so today is the last day for the drive through and uh, so next sabbath there will be no longer any drive through you'll have to either mail your tithes and offerings in or um, uh, physically mail them in or give online or give them to somebody who's coming to church and they can bring your tithes and offerings so just wanted to remind you of that and also our condolences to um, Helen Downey, who passed away on May 24th in Colorado. Um, our con I'm sorry? Oh, I just, I just copied the announcement. So she passed away. That's right, she did. Because I, I spoke to Carl the other day. I just, I just uh, pasted the announcement. But she passed away here. And um, there's some information there where you can send cards, <coughs> uh, condolence uh, greeting cards. And um, Sabbath school classes, read the bulletin, insert the bulletin, what it says about our Sabbath school classes, how things have changed there. And um, those two rooms needed, there's uh, one individual who's an Adventist young man who needs a room, so please read that announcement. And then there's a young single Christian woman whom the Longs know very well. Talk to them because she is also looking for a room, and uh, so talk to the Longs about that. And also, uh, we had a board meeting last uh, this past Monday, and as we always do in our board meetings, we look at our church finances. Every month, um, we have a treasurer's report, and I want to thank Scoble, for uh, our treasurer, for uh, doing those amazing reports. And I want to share the good news with you. January through May, our givings have been in the black considering the pandemic that we were not worshiping together in person for 11 weeks and we encourage people to give online we are still doing the drive-throughs here uh, I think this is like the 14th week now that we're doing the drive-through um, our offerings have been in the black so we yes amen praise the Lord 
So uh, we want to thank all of you who are uh, listening in and are watching. Uh, and those of you who are physically present, thank you so much for your generosity. And I just want to give a shout out to those who are, uh, have birthdays in June. There's a lot of birthdays this month. Look in your bulletin. Uh, Chris Keller, he's here someplace. Chris Keller, uh, um, Cindy Bajorquez, I don't know if Cindy's watching, but happy birthday to you. Ron Sherrington, Velma Taylor, Rhiannon Abrahams, happy birthday to all of those uh, wonderful people. Oh, Victor, did I miss, I, I miss Victor. Yeah. <laughs> Why aren't they in here? Well, it's, okay. <laughs> well, you know, let's put that. So the boys, uh, the twin boys are turning 15, 15 years old, John and Josh. So happy birthday to you guys too. And happy birthday to, to Victor as well. <laughs> Juliet's husband. <laughs> you, I'm glad you mentioned that. You're a good wife, Juliet. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, God bless you. And, um, and those are our church news. And let's have an opening word of prayer at this moment. Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful morning. And thank you for your Sabbath. We pray that you will bless us, Lord, through your spirit. Um, bless all of those who are watching from their homes, on their computers, on their tablets, their TVs, their phones. We pray that you will bless us here, Lord. And this service, Lord, is for your honor and glory. May Jesus be lifted up. May Jesus be our focus. And may our hearts and minds be turned to him this morning. We ask this in his precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite uh, Rosa to come on up and she has the children's story. Now, of course, we're not asking the children to come down forward. So, Rosa, you're basically telling the story to all of us, <laughs> but also to the children in TV land. <laughs> you, can, you can stand here. Or, yes, do you want a mic? Do you want this one? Um, no, I think we'll be able to do Can okay. everyone hear me? Well, you'll, yeah. let's put this down <laughs> here. You'll have to use this mic for the live stream. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. at least they can hear you. All right. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so I'm happy to be back. And um, right away, I got a children's story <laughs> to tell you. So my children's story uh, takes um, place in, in Mark. So I know with um, everything that's going on in our world today, it's a little um, disruptive. It's um, painful, it's sorrowful, it's um, scary, it's really uncertain. And um, this reminds me of, um, of Mark, um, a story of Mark uh, 439, where um, Jesus and his disciples were in a boat and there was um, a storm that was happening. There was a dark clouds and raging waters. And, um, and thank you. And in Revelation, it mentions that waters represents people, nations, and tongues. And um, some bodies of water are bigger than others. Some are small. Some are found um, in little countries. But it's found all over the world, just like people are. We're all over the world. Some are bigger societies, cities, communities. Others are very small. Um, the bodies um, are the bodies of water are held together by earth. That's the way that God intended them to be. They have limits and they have boundaries. I believe the earth represents laws that keep people together. They keep them accountable. They keep societies running and flourishing. Um, and the laws vary from, uh, we have like worldly laws, we have community laws, state laws, federal laws, depending on our region and our, um, I guess what the, the societies need uh, to survive and be held accountable. Um, the thing about man's laws though, they change over time. Um, they change depending on 
the advancements of technology, knowledge, and um, the ever-changing hearts of men. Uh, so I've made an illustration for you, and please forgive me, I never took an art class. I think my <laughs> art history end stopped at like maybe the second grade, but here we go. Make sure to show the kids over there too. Wow. Oh, wow. So for this illustration, man's laws are represented by this sandcastle. Although it's beautiful and it takes knowledge to create such a thing, but it does change over time. The, uh, the rock or stone over here is the laws of God that are never changing, that last throughout time. Okay, so these, these laws were given by God to mankind. They don't change, they're everlasting, and they include everyone. It doesn't exclude any people from any part of the world. They're called the Ten Commandments, of course. <laughs> and um, so we're going to talk about Mark 4, 39. So Jesus was in the boat with some of his disciples. And you may have, you may know this story. So there was a terrible storm that happened. Um, the disciples were panicking because Jesus was asleep. Even though all this rushing water and crashing winds and the boat was uh, toppling over, water was rushing into the boat itself, Jesus still stayed asleep. So they panicked. They were afraid for their own lives. And so they decided to wake Jesus up and they cried to him, Master, do you not care that we perish? Jesus woke up. And he asked them, well, where is your faith? I believe Jesus knew what was going on. Of course, he felt the wind, he felt the storm, and he could hear the sorrow and pain and panic in the disciples' hearts. That's kind of what we're going through now. We're seeing this destruction and people are raging against one another and we're searching for God and Jesus and he knows what's going on. You can hear the cries of everyone, those that walk in his, in his laws and those that don't, those who are angry and lost. Jesus woke up and he says, peace, be still. And the storm stopped and the waters stopped raging. I believe it's when we put our vanity aside, our egos and our own will for ignorance that God will stand up and he will say, peace, be still. I believe that the people, nations, and tongues, they're, they're raging right now. They're out of control, they're lost. And I'm not saying for no reason. It all started with, I think, a peaceful protest for, for something, a crime that was committed. But it, now it's um, yielding its ugly face into something that we've never seen before. And a lot of us are losing sleep, we're losing faith, we're losing hope. And it doesn't matter how um, the governors and the presidents and the city councilmen and the police officers try to make amends or peace with people. The hearts of men and the laws of men are constantly changing when the raging waters come, which represent the people, it will cause a destruction. We will try and change. So this sandcastle will eventually crumble under the power of the people. 
because they're out of control. They don't have any boundaries. Boundaries are good. They keep us together and one as communities and families. But God's law, it doesn't matter how much the wind and the water crush against the sides of the mountain, it stands firm over time and over the hearts of men. We can believe that the Ten Commandments are going to keep us safe. We have to have faith in the Lord. And when we're willing to open up our hearts, he will come down and he will say, peace, be still, for I am with you. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Before Bianca comes up and does our scripture reading, I just want to remind our viewers uh, what you see on the screen here. Um, we're going to have our praise time in a little bit and mention your the reasons why you're grateful and, of course, your prayer requests. So be texting that number on the screen, and um, we'll be mentioning those uh, in just a little bit. Bianca? Our scripture reading this morning is Acts 15, 1 and 2. Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small decision and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to his word. Amen. Okay, before Bruce has our prayers, uh, prayer requests, uh, I want to share with some of you folk that are texting me, uh, that are watching this, some of their uh, reasons for uh, being grateful to God and some of the prayer requests. Uh, first thing I want to mention right off the bat is, um, again, thank the Lord for all of these birthdays that we just mentioned a little bit ago and for God giving all of them another year. My my brother-in-law who uh, in Tucson also, it's uh, his birthday, not today, but it's going to be his birthday on the 19th and so we want to wish him a happy birthday as well and this one's coming from Todd Beeson he uh, welcome to the Beesons of course whom we all know and love their blessing uh, they thank God for uh, nature and uh, prayers that God gives him the strength and knowledge to fix his car tomorrow to get home <laughs> so apparently they're stuck someplace and he says happy Sabbath to everybody so <laughs> So let's pray. Let's pray uh, for that. And then uh, the Vasquez family, Raul and Renee, they're thankful for their church sisters who prayed for me. Uh, my doctor said I do not need the surgery. Amen to that. Uh, I praise my loving Lord and please hear my sister's needs. And um, this one comes from Chris Albrecht, who is here right now. <laughs> But he's saying uh, his roommate Mason will find out if his house, where Chris and, and Mason live, will be sold this week. Pray that God's will be done. And if it sells, that he guides us where to go next. So you may be house hunting. You and Mason may be house hunting soon, Chris. Yeah, so we're definitely going to pray uh, to God for that. And the Guzman family, uh, Joey, I see him sitting back there. Good to see you. And Lydia and Araceli are in the, the room. Okay. Um, Happy Sabbath. They, uh, they're caring for their one-year-old niece, Maricela, and asking for prayers and blessings. Now, you know, if you're here present, you can raise your hand. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you can raise your hand and just uh, vocalize it here. Um, Bob, who was with us for a number of weeks, remember Bob? Yeah, Bob Austin. 
and uh, he's back. He was supposed to join us this weekend, but something fell through, and so he's not here, obviously, this weekend. But he says, Happy Sabbath. Um, wish he could be here with us, as I mentioned. And um, my sister, Eva, her birthday is in June as well, on the 17th. So happy birthday, Eva. Uh, that's coming from my mom. And then my sister, Diana, from Los Angeles. Uh, she says, happy Sabbath. She's grateful for the Tempe SDA Church. How many you say amen? Grateful for the Tempe SDA Church. Uh, she goes to the Pico Rivera Bilingual Church in Los Angeles. After our board meeting Thursday, we they decided to wait until August to reopen. So they're they're still holding off, and um, they're uh, so they just need to hold off a little bit. And she's asking prayer for her church in the Los Angeles area churches as well. And I think that is it from the our live stream viewers and uh, Elisa. And then Judy. We pray for my teacher, Patty. Yes. She has a very, um, she's really sick. Right. And also to pray for your brother-in-law, Sergio. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. And um, so prayers for Patricia, uh, a professor at uh, Monterellos University, who uh, one of the professors of my my wife, and she's taking online courses. And also my, my own, uh, in fact, Eva, I just mentioned her birthday, her husband, uh, Sergio, is, I believe he's still in the hospital with COVID-19. And so we need to pray for, for him, please. Yes. And to pray for my, my uh, wife's brother as well. Yeah. Judy. Oh, we're thankful that our, daughter, our granddaughter, Samantha, is Yes, good today. to see you, Samantha. Yeah. And she I hasn't said. been with us since before the virus started, so she's happy to be with us. And I'm requesting prayer for her. She's having some health issues that oh. they're still investigating and doing tests. Okay. And so just uh, prayer so for her. So let's pray for Sam and... Oh, good. Well, July is the best month for birthdays. You all know that, right? <laughs> it is, of course. And uh, let's pray for Sam's health. Okay, anybody else here? Uh, Denise. Uh, is very discouraged. Okay, so we need to pray for Bruce's sister. She's kind of down right now. She's very discouraged. So let's be praying for Bruce's sister and Mildred. Pray for my brother. He's going through some difficult circumstances right now. Okay. I got those to bring him back to him. Okay, so let's pray for Mildred's brother going through some very difficult circumstances right now. And you had something else? Yeah, Katie's a friend from school. Oh. Friend, and the, and the okay, so Katie's uh, friend's mom has COVID-19, so let's be praying for her. And Noemi, good to see you. And by the way, it's good to see Shiloh here. Good to see you here. <laughs> yes, they will be back permanently. Oh. All right. Also, I'm praying. Marco will find an open door for him to come back to. Oh, okay. So no, we're glad to see Shiloh here, and Shiloh and Jaden are going to be back permanently. They were in Michigan for about a year now. It's been about a year, over a year. And uh, so praying that the, that that will transition will go smooth. And Noemi, as a typical mom, wants her son to be here locally. So pray that doors will open for Malcolm to come back here in Arizona. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else? My wife, yes. Our son, because the work that he's doing. Yes, so, so prayers, uh, and also for my wife. Uh, my wife and my son are frontline workers. They, you know, they have authorization letters uh, in case it gets, well, I don't think you're going to stop now, but everything's reopened. But, um, but pray for my son and uh, my wife as chaplain and CNA. Pray for them. Anyone else? No more birthdays in June? <laughs> okay. Well, I want to invite Bruce to come on up. And I, I sort of uh, usurped this part simply because I was reading the online, Bruce, uh, the online. Uh, I do want to mention this one. This is the last one that came through from Shirley Beeson. Praise the Lord for her brother being open to receive the Lord's mission, me, uh, message during their Bible study. He's had a couple of eye-opening messages. Praise God, everybody. So uh, be praying for uh, Shirley Beeson's brother 
that uh, he will be drawn close to the Lord's heart. At this time, can we kneel before our maker? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you today grateful for the freedom to worship you. We want to ask for blessings and praise you for blessings that we've already received because health and finances are often a double-edged sword. We have blessings and we have challenges. And Lord, we want to thank you for both of them and help us to see our way through those struggles that we have. We ask for strength and wisdom to deal with our temporary challenges, Lord, in this life and, and remind us that we have something forward to look forward to, a life to come with you in heaven. We want to Praise you for your worldwide church and yet strengthen them, Lord, because in various areas of the United States and the world, we have challenges that are seemingly sometimes in our minds unsurmountable. But with you, Lord, everything is possible and all good will come in the end. We want to thank you for the Sabbath day that we're, we can come apart. And I want to come back to families, Lord. There are so many issues in our families both in our physical families and our church families. Lord, we want to, we ask you and plead and beg that you strengthen us in, in a, where we have challenges with our families for health and finances and work and travel. And we also want to praise you, Lord, for where you've answered our prayers and you've given us the guidance and the, the will to go on and to be a witness, a living witness for you in this kingdom. We understand in these times of troubles with the COVID-19 and the racial unrest that we have in, in specifically in this country, we want to ask you to help us to give us strength and to remind us that we are a witness and that we can bring more people to your throne by our calm composure and our strength and trust in you. And we also want to ask for blessings for the pastor as he brings your word to us, both here and on camera, that we may be blessed and strengthened and encouraged by those words. All these things we ask for in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to move this big pulpit out of the way. <clears throat> I don't like be hiding. It's not hiding, but I'd rather be more exposed to, uh, to the audience <clears throat> than being behind the, um, behind the pulpit. One of these days, uh, I like to get one of those transparent ones, those plexiglass pulpits. But then uh, some individuals say, no, I'd rather have the wooden pulpit where I could be a little bit <laughs> behind it. Well, how was everybody's week this week? Did everybody have a good week? Yes, good. You all had a good week? Did every, anybody have a challenging week this week. Any challenges this week? 
You had a challenging week this week, okay. Yep, one person had a challenging week. Well, that's pretty good. Denise, you had a challenging week this week, okay. We have two. See, it just takes one to start it. Now we had another <laughs> who had the challenging week. Anybody else with a challenging week this week? Back there, back there. You see, it takes one brave person to start it off, and then everybody else's hands are going up because you're unsure. Well, I don't know if I should admit it or not. Anybody else have a challenging week? Okay. <clears throat> so we had good weeks. We had a challenging week. How many of you have been keeping up on the news? Raise your hands if you've been keeping up on the news. Okay, I think most of us have the things that are happening in our world. <clears throat> um, last week, last week uh, I talked about the the things that we have been witnessing in our world today, and all of the protests and uh, um, everything that started since May, was it May 25, Memorial Day, was it the 25th? <clears throat> everything that started on May 25th with the death of George Floyd the, by the hands of the police. And uh, things have just, uh, there have been movements and things in our world, and this is worldwide, these protests are worldwide, that um, many of us have never seen in our lives before. <clears throat> I was alive in 1967 uh, when the riots took place in Los Angeles. I was alive, but I don't remember those riots. Some of you may remember the riots in LA uh, after the death of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, 67, 68, all of the war protests against Vietnam and the thousands of people. Again, I was alive, but I was a kid. I don't remember all of those. <clears throat> um, and uh, <clears throat> some of you re may remember the protest just nine years ago, the Arab Spring. How many of you have seen on news all of those protests from the Arab Spring? Yeah, it started in Tunisia and, and uh, uh, Libya and Egypt and all of these countries. Unfortunately, many of those protests that started in these Arab countries <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know, I have something in my throat. Some, many of those protests were <clears throat> caused the downfall of some of the, some of the uh, prime ministers and leaders such as in Egypt, uh, Gaddafi in, in uh, Libya, Muammar Gaddafi. But um, those protests unfortunately didn't end up procuring what they sought out to, to uh, gain. And that was more of a democratic form of, <coughs> excuse me, of leadership, a democratic form of government. And so in that sense, um, they didn't have much success, unfortunately. And uh, <coughs> most of you remember those protests. Now, of course, now we have these protests. Um, so I started talking about this last week. Um, just a really a, a quick recap that has been going on for last, specifically this last week. Um, We've all seen the violence that has taken place, uh, the peaceful protests that have taken place. I would be amiss if I didn't mention that. The peaceful protests, right? And then a minority, I really want to emphasize this, a minority of those protesters have been the ones that have sort of usurped the peaceful protests and have vandalized and have looted. Right here in Arizona, of course, the... Um, Oh, what's that mall called? The Fashion, Fashion Square, is that what it's called? The Fashion Square Mall in Scottsdale, which is now reopened. Uh, you've seen those news where they were just breaking those windows and, and, and breaking through the mall. It's a very beautiful place, by the way, that, that mall. It's now reopened. Um, it was a minority of those that have caused all of this damage. Um, most of the protests have been peaceful. peaceful. Of course, the news is going to focus on all of the break-ins and all of the graffiti and all of this stuff, obviously the news is going to focus on that because you tend to click on those things more and they attract more eyes, which means more ratings, which means more attention, which means you're paying attention to ABC or CBS or all of these other things. You're going to do that because the dogs that bark the loudest get the most attention. I'm not calling anybody dogs, but you're not going to see more... Uh, to a, a general degree, more of those peaceful ones. So those protests have been peaceful, um, but they're ongoing around the world. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, bad things happen. 
things get out of hand, setting a, a motorcycle policeman on fire in, in Guadalajara, Mexico, um, or, uh, you know, or Chaz. You've heard about Chaz lately. Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in Seattle, uh, Washington. Um, don't tell me you don't know about this, what's going on in Seattle. Um, the, uh, the city officials basically gave up the East Precinct in Seattle, the police precinct, and now there's about six blocks or so uh, that protesters have took over. It's the autonomous zone. I'm not gonna show a bunch of videos and photos that I did last week. I've got lobs of them, but there was this one sign that said, you are now, you are now, uh, what did it say? You are now exiting the United States of America when you go into this zone. Um, I'm not gonna get into politics. Some people are in favor of that, others are against, but just to inform, that's what's going on in Seattle. I do want to mention this though, before I go into what I promised you last week, go into the Bible. <clears throat> um, Newark, New Jersey. I know our conference president, he's from New Jersey. He would be proud to, to highlight this. In Newark, New Jersey, there's protests going on, but not one building vandalized. Not one riot happening in Newark, uh, Newark New Jersey. And uh, I saw the interview with the chief of police, African-American chief of police in, in Newark, and uh, also uh, the mayor in Newark. And they say that the differences that they made is that pre-protest, pre-George Floyd, all, before all of this happened, they were engaged in anti-bias training of the police department. The police officers were engaged in their community, et cetera. And the citizens in Newark have said this, all of this that is happening around the world, the rioting, the, the looting, the, the violence, it is not going to happen to our city. And it's not mainly a cause of an overwhelming police force being there uh, preventing uh, these things from happening, dressed in riot gear, but it was because of the pre-training and the preparation before that took place. And so, you know, uh, a good thing is happening in Newark, New Jersey, which I believe is a model for these other cities uh, to duplicate what they what they did over there. Um, good news. Sort of opposites. On the opposite sides of, of the country, what happened in Seattle and what's happening in Newark, New Jersey, complete opposites. Complete opposites. To me, that's the way I see it anyway. Um, some people have pointed out that George Floyd's uh, criminal past and using counterfeit bills and having drug substances in his blood on the day he died. Some people will point that out and say that, you know, he was not a hero. Um, that's besides the point because those are facts. Those are facts, uh, what had happened that day when he was arrested. Um, and that is true. But in spite of this, no person should be treated the way he was on that day. And I'm saying this live on YouTube because nobody, regardless of your criminal, should be pressed on like that. And uh, in fact, he was saying, uh, they were saying, well, get up. I, this is something I don't understand. Get up, get up, get up. Well, he had four policemen on him. So nobody deserves to be treated that way. Let me transition into what I think the greatest human protest has been in our world. Um, historians may take issue with this, but this is what I believe to be true, that the greatest human protest that changed society and introduced new political, social, and economic freedoms never before seen in the history of the world was the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. That was the greatest protest ever. And the reason why I say that is because many of our individual and societal freedoms um, today are due to the revolution that the reformers started in the 16th century, that a hierarchy should not police your conscience. That's what they were fighting for. A hierarchy, a government should not police your conscience because that is between you and God a democratic way of governance, free inquiry, and mass publicizing. Now, in their day, mass publicizing meant the Gutenberg press. 
pressing, uh, publishing books. And Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther took advantage of that, and there was mass publications of his works that went out all over the place. That was their, uh, that was their social media of the day. The Reformation caused controversy and wars, that's true, but vital change is not easy and always costs. The very fact that in our country today, we can protest and demonstrate peacefully, mind you, we can do that is due to the fact of what the reformers did back in the 16th century and introducing and paving the way for a new government in a new world on these shores. So the very fact that we're seeing these protests is a testament to many countries' constitutional freedoms, which in turn owe their existence to what the Protestant Reformation accomplished. That's how I see history and what the Protestant Reformation did. Does the Bible have anything to say about protest? Now, this is what I promised last week that we would share today what the Bible says. Does the Bible say anything about protesting? Yes or no? Well, it may not use that word protesting. So I'm using that word very loosely, protest. But the Bible has plenty of events and circumstances and situations where people were protesting, either protesting in a negative way, in other words, something against that was good, or protesting something against, uh, protesting against evil. You'll have both sides to this. So, I don't, again, I don't have any slides for you this morning. In fact, uh, we can probably turn that off. Uh, well, you can't turn that off from here. In fact, you see on the top where it says play, just click that play. No, to your right. Over to your right. To your right, honey. Right there. Just click that. We'll, okay, there we go. So does the Bible have anything to say about protest? I want to share some passages with you, and this is in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. And I'm just going to read the verses right off of my notes. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. And then what I want to do this morning is I want to share these things with you, what the Bible says, and then I want to extract some principles from these uh, Bible passages and what we can learn today when we want to protest. Now, again, I'm using that word protest loosely because when I say if we're going to protest today, you and I are always protesting every single day. I'm not talking about going out in, in, in mass crowds and holding up signs. I'm not talking about that. And I mentioned this last week. You may protest against your own spouse on his or her opinion on what they're doing or what they did. Or what? Or didn't. Or didn't, <laughs> or didn't do. Children are always protesting against other children, whether it be siblings or whether it's on the playground. I was here first. You get off. I got this, I got this swing first. There's always protesting going on. You may have protested in a very tactful way and maybe even under your breath against your boss for things that are happening at the workplace. We're protesting all the time. And so they may be little minor things. They may be what we're seeing today, major things. But human beings, we're, we're always in protesting or disagreeing or disputing or debating or arguing or fighting. We all do that. It's constant, constant, whether it's in the church or outside of the church. We're always, we're always engaged in, in something to that effect. Okay, so going back to Daniel chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, says this. <clears throat> then the commissioners and satraps began trying... By the way, satraps were very, very wealthy people. This is in Babylon. The commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But what does the Bible say? They were unable. They could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption in as much as he, referring to Daniel, in as much as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Now, this is referring to Daniel. Wouldn't you like to be that kind of person? No, you're impeccable. There's nothing wrong with you. So then these men said, 
we will not find any ground of accusation against Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. So here you have, and I'll come back to this later as I said, here you have a protest against a good person. Somebody who has a great track record in the administration of the king in the palace. I mean, they, they just cannot find anything to, the, they can't pinpoint anything against Daniel's character. And so these men with, as I'll share this later, I don't, I don't want to get too much ahead of myself, with ulterior motives, were protesting to the king against Daniel. We'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, in Acts chapter 5, verse 33, <clears throat> Acts chapter 5, and verse 33, I'm going to center myself a little bit more here. The Bible says this, but when they, the Jewish, this is the Jewish uh, religious council. These are the religious leaders, the, the big guys, the important guys, the ones with, you know, all of the PhDs and the degrees, etc. I'm not knocking education, but these are the big religious leaders. <laughs> That's who they were. But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. This is in reference to the apostles. They wanted to kill these guys. Um, and actually, um, there was progressive animosity against the disciples here. Um, I don't have time to go through this, but first there was an annoyance. They were just annoyed. These religious leaders were annoyed by the apostles teaching and preaching about Jesus Christ in the streets and in the marketplaces, in public. They were annoyed by this. It started with annoyance, and then it uh, resorted to arrest. They were actually arrested, and then they were let go, and then they began to be threatened. This is the third one. They were threatened. Number four, there was jealousy. Of course, jealousy is boiling underneath the surface all this time. And then number five, there was an intent to murder. That was the progressive animosity towards the disciples. That's Acts chapter 5, verse 33. They were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. That is premeditated murder against the apostles for teaching about Jesus. They were protesting, if you will, that word. They were protesting against these men because not only were they preaching about Jesus Christ crucified and he was risen, but by default, the blame and guilt was placed upon them, the religious leaders, because they're the ones that shouted crucify him and they were the, they were the leaders with this mob and they influenced this mob, almost rioting, almost rioting, but the Roman soldiers made sure they didn't get to that point. But they were the leaders of the mob that were demanding to kill Jesus and crucify him. And they were protesting against the apostles for having this dastardly nerve to preach in the name of Jesus that he was resurrected. Here's another one in Acts chapter 19. I really like this one because this sort of fits close to uh, what we're seeing today. In Acts chapter 19, starting with verse 23. Acts chapter 19, verse 23. How many of you have ever read the entire book of Acts? You read the, I love that book. One of these days, I want to do a whole series on that book. I just, I just, it's an amazing book. The book of Acts, chapter 19, starting with verse 23. Verse 23, and it says this. About that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way, capital W. That's what Christianity was called before people were called Christians. They were first called Christians in the city of Antioch in modern Syria today. Um, they were first called Christians there. Before, it was just called The Way. In fact, I have a Bible. I used to one called The Way. Um, verse 24, For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis. This is uh, the Greek goddess Diana, otherwise known as Diana. Silver shrines of Artemis was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul 
has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours would fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. This was one of the wonders of the city of Ephesus was the temple of Diana or the temple of Artemis. Um, it was just magnificent, a magnificent structure. Verse 28, when they heard this, and were filled with rage, they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The city was filled with a confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul himself wanted to go into the assembly, the Bible says, the disciples wouldn't let him because they knew that this is just a hot spot. You do not want to go in there. They were trying to protect him. Also, some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his, these were political leaders in Ephesus, uh, the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So then, some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. And this, they were in danger of rioting. Hundreds and hundreds of people went into the theater, and they were shouting, the Bible says one thing, others were shouting another thing, and it was all started by the silversmith Demetrius and the other tradesmen. Why were they protesting against Paul? Why were they protesting against Paul? The crowd quite didn't understand everything that was going on. But as it goes, when you see a large crowd, when you're driving along the freeway and there's red and blue lights flashing and you're driving down the freeway, what do you do? Why do you slow down? You want to look. We all turn into looky-loos when we see red and, and blue uh, lights flashing, don't you? Or when there's a large crowd and you automatically are curious. That's just you automatically go over there or you that catches your attention. You want to see what's happening. When you see a large crowd gathering and they start shouting and there's movement and there's a tumult going on, that really grabs your attention. You want to know what's going on. And this is exactly what's happening over there. And in fact, some wise guy, a wise man, not a wise guy, but a wise man came and say, hey, let's calm down because we're on the verge of rioting. If that happens, we're going to get the Roman soldiers in here and people are going to start being killed. People are going to start being speared. There's going to be hurt going on. Things are going to be damaged. Things are going to be destroyed. People are going to get hurt. People are going to die. Let's calm down, guys. Because of this protest against Paul. And Paul was, uh, and they're holding them back. Because Paul wanted to go in there and try and explain things and what was really happening. And I'll go back to why these men started this protest in the first place. As I said, I'll go back. Um, there's other protests that were, um, that seem to be uh, sort of counterintuitive to what Jesus would do, to what Jesus himself would do. I'm reading Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13. For those of you who are watching, open your Bibles and turn to that text or on your phone. Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13. The Bible says this. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple. And you know what Jesus did? He got a little physical here. He got a little physical, which seems to not be, you know, characteristic of who Jesus is. Because the Bible says, and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. In fact, in one of the other Gospels, this is in Matthew, it says that he got some cords together and made a little whip. Now, if I were Jesus, I would have whipped the money changers. Let's just be, <laughs> what are you guys doing? 
But he didn't do that. He didn't whip the people. What did he whip? Started whipping the animals. Now that's not abuse. And that's Jesus isn't just whipping them out of anger. He's like going hop shot. That's what he's doing. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And getting the animals to to move out of there. And uh, you know, here's the tables of money changers, and he just wham, and he just overturns them. Seems like Jesus is, you know, dare I say it, being a little what? The V word? A little bit violent here. At least that's, maybe that's what some people thought. But he wasn't harming anybody. He wasn't defacing church property or buildings. But this is what the Bible says. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. I don't think Jesus said it the way I said it. Hey, Jesus is doing this. He says, it's written. This house shall be called the house of prayer, not a robber's den. He was upset. Jesus was upset. And he had good reason to be upset, which I'll get into in a little bit. Here's another one. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, now, this took place a long time ago. If you want to call it a protest, you may use another term, but for the purposes of today's message, I'm calling it a protest. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. This is talking about Noah. And the Bible says, And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Now here it says Noah was a preacher. In Genesis chapter 6, it doesn't necessarily mention that he was a preacher. It mentions that he was a carpenter. He was a builder. He built that big ship. In fact, you go to Nebraska. I can't remember the name of uh, the city in Nebraska that has Noah's Ark, the museum. Uh, we almost, uh, because of the COVID-19, there was going to be a large nationwide Seventh-day Adventist pastors gathering in Nebraska. I can't remember where. In, oh, I'm sorry, in Kentucky. I'm sorry, thank you. In Kentucky, and of course that was all canceled, but not far from where our conven the convention center, Lexington Convention Center, I think in Kentucky, uh, we were going to go to this Noah's Ark. Um, they say it's amazing. You can see it online. It's just absolutely amazing. Life-size Noah's Ark, and it's amusing. You go inside, and it's, it's pretty cool stuff. But uh, Noah was a builder. But it says here in Peter, uh, he was a preacher of righteousness. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, the Bible says, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now, you can read that in different ways. Building the ark just by virtue of seeing a big ship and him being a preacher of righteousness that someday the world is going to be destroyed. The world is coming to an end. The world is coming to an end. He actually gave a date. He said 120 years because that's what the Bible says. Somebody comes and starts, the world will end, you know, and such and such will be destroyed on July 15, 2020. Or July 18 is what they're, some Christians are predicting. You know, you kind of like, oh, I don't know about those dates. But Noah knew in 120 years the world's going to be destroyed. And he was condemning the crowd of his day, protesting against the evils that were so prevalent in his day. And in just people's mindsets and their behaviors and just their way of thinking about society and each other. It was just very violent. And Moses was preaching against these things. He was a protester in favor of justice and equity and fair play and love and compassion and forgiveness and right doing. That's what Noah was in his day. Here's another passage for you. How about God protesting? You ever think of God protesting? Well, I don't know if, honestly, I don't know if this is protesting as much as, as it is. It's protesting as much as it is judgment. 
um, because there could be a difference. When you're protesting something, you want to change something, you want to reform something. Here, God is basically saying, uh, you know, this is just my judgment. These are my judgment calls. Um, and uh, that's against the Pharaoh. Do you think it would be correct to say that God was protesting the slavery of his people? Oh, yes. And God raised the man to be a leader, to be the leader of this movement to free the slaves, to free this, these people who are in slavery. And even at that, God's initial judgments, so he, he began to send plagues on the Egyptians during the Pharaoh's day. And God's initial judgments, his plagues were soft. I don't know if you ever caught this, and I'm, I don't want to go into deal about, detail about this, but it's just interesting. If you read about those ten plagues in the book of Exodus that God poured out upon the Egyptians, the first plagues are very soft, what I call soft, um, in order to soften Pharaoh's heart, like a snake. Well, the Egyptians duplicated the snake. Remember Moses' rod, Aaron's rod turned into snake, and the Egyptians duplicated that. Um, water turned to blood which the Egyptians, of course, duplicated. They still had water. They had to dig around the Nile. The Nile was full of blood. But the Egyptians duplicated that, but they had to dig around the Nile. That's what the Bible says. Frogs, which the Egyptians duplicated. You think God knew that they would duplicate these things? Of course he did. It's like God's starting out the little things and soft. I kind of take a like, God is protesting to them, but he's still... <laughs> He's going to start off slow and soft in hopes that the Pharaoh would repent and see the light. Well, obviously that didn't happen. And then, of course, the next one and the next one, gnats. Um, from the gnats on, the Egyptians couldn't duplicate. The gnats, insects, plague on Egyptians, livestock, boils on the Egyptians, hail destroying Egyptian vegetation, locusts eating everything that remain, darkness over Egypt, and finally, the tenth and last one had to do with death of human beings. That was the last plague. I think God was protesting, but at the same time, he was making these very severe or, or, or serious judgment calls against those that were enslaving his people and against their gods, by the way. Other mentionables, the prophets uh, protested. What did some of the prophets, many of the prophets, protest against? the prevalent sins of the people, of God's people. I'm not talking about the outsiders from the church. The prophets that God had sent were to reform and correct those on the inside of the church. And of course you have those stories like Jonah where God is concerned about other nations as well, about the Assyrians. Jonah wants you to go preach to the Assyrians and tell them that you know they're going down the wrong path. And you know the story, you know that story. Cain against Abel. Maybe you can call that a protest. <laughs> Reformation unleashed. All right, so let me come to these points that I told you I would have come to. Um, I titled this sermon last week and today, The Right Way to Protest. The Right Way to Protest. So I want to share uh, a few things with you, a few points. Number one, if you're going to protest something, again, I use that term loosely because you can, we can say if you're going to disagree with something, if you're going to disagree with something, number one, know what you're disagreeing about. Know what you're protesting. Educate yourself. Don't just say anything and prove to everybody that you're a fool because of the foolish things that you said. <laughs> it's better to be quiet and no. Now, uh, obviously, there's going to be some smaller issues that you're not going to need an hour to think about. Um, the bigger the issue is, like the issues that we're seeing today about injustice and reformation of the police department and racial injustices and uh, you know, the systemic 
uh, prejudice uh, that is ingrained. I have, you know, I have a book in my office called the, the Color of Law. I went to an ASU event and the author was there and I, I purchased the book and I learned that the author was going to be there and I, you know, I got to go see him. It's called The Color of Law. When I mentioned systemic racism, um, you ought to get this book and read it, The Color of Law. Back in the, oh, 40s, uh, post-World War in the 50s and the 60s, when I mean systemic, it was systemic. Banks, banks, insurance companies, uh, real estate brokers, the real estate field uh, and profession and banks and, and these uh, high institutions were all involved in redlining neighborhoods to keep the term back then, the Negro, to keep the Negro in these neighborhoods, to keep them out of the white neighborhoods. And it was deliberate and purposeful by institutions such as the ones that I mentioned. Local and federal governments, um, this is systemic. This is very systemic. And uh, in the book talks about these ghettos, the urban centers and the ghettos and the barrios and and how um, the only reason why African Americans are in these places is because they're lazy, they don't want to work, etc. All of that is, that may be true in some cases, just as, as it's true in the cases of whites and Hispanics. There's always going to be that group in any race, Filipinos, any race, where they're going to be lazy and they're not going to want to work and they're going to be no good to not contribute to life. Um, Iraq, Iran, they're all over the place all over but this book covers some really really good information on how the systemic uh, uh, racism against the african-american you got to get the book the color of law anyways know what you're protesting educate yourself on the issue know why you're there or know what you're going to say with your significant other or somebody well i disagree with this because just just be informed that's a simple one number two Protest for the right reason. Protest for the right reason. An injustice, something criminal, tyranny, um, those are right reasons to protest, wouldn't you think? I mentioned the Protestant Reformation. They were protesting against a religious hierarchy that dictated to you what you should think, how you should go to God, what you should what you should. Uh, believe in this and that. No, all religious organizations do that. Our church does that. We have our uh, we have our set of beliefs. But the difference in those days was that if you dare go against the church, you were deemed a heretic and therefore worthy of imprisonment or martyrdom or torture, etc. You couldn't think for yourself. You couldn't think for yourself. And the scriptures were deliberately kept from the masses. So that's a big difference. But anyways, injustices, something criminal, something tyrannical, you can protest against rightful punishment or discipline against you for wrongdoing. That's just a crybaby's excuse. In fact, this is what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul says, if you sorrow, if you experience sorrow, because you are being persecuted for the name of Christ, then that's a good sorrow. He says, that's a good thing. The Lord, will, the Lord will strengthen you. He will give you joy. That's a good thing. He says, but if you're experiencing the kind of sorrow that's your own fault for wrongdoing, he says, then you're getting what you deserve. It's basically what Paul says. That's true. So protest for the right reason. Don't protest because you did something wrong and now you're suffering the consequences because of your wrongdoing. I would say that protest and that, that ill, that sorrow, that anger is ill-founded because all you have to do is look in the mirror and say, it was my fault. I got what I deserved. So protest or disagree for the right reason. And let me go back to some of these Bible stories that I mentioned now. Noah protested the evils of his day, much like we need to do today. But he combined that very direct preaching and warnings with appeals to people to turn from their ways, not with violence, not with threats, but with heartfelt concern. 
He was protesting for the right thing and did it the right way. Jesus cleansing the temple. I mentioned that earlier. He protested the fact that a place of worship was turned into a flea market and probably with unjust balances for corrupt profit. In fact, Ellen White brings this out. When Back then, when you bought something, they had these balances. And you had a, a, a rock or a stone that was the standard. And then your money payments was weighed against that. Well, they were, these corrupt uh, sellers, these vendors, would mess with that weight so that they would gain profit for themselves. This angered Jesus. This is why today we even have, you go to a gas station and sometimes you'll see those seals on the gas pump. You ever see those seals? And it says the Department of Seals and something, weights and Department of Weights and Measures, because they go there and they have to make sure that those gas pumps are correctly calibrated so that you're paying just prices for the gas. You ever do that when I'm, I do that sometimes. I'm pumping gas and the gas is like, you know, nowadays is like $2.19, for example. And I'll go, well, I know 219 times 10 is 2119. So I'll pump till 10 gallons. I'll look at the gallon section. You ever do that before? Anybody do this? You do that? I do that many times. And I'll stop right at 10 gallons. And I'll see, should, is it 2119? Sometimes it'll say 2120 because it's the gas is $2.19.99. <laughs> you know, and I often do that. And almost 100% of the time, they're, they're well calibrated. But Jesus came into the temple and he was upset because these guys were profiteering and were cheating the people. Not only that, but they turned the house of worship and the house of prayer into a swap meet and the flea market right there in the court. And that just, oh, Jesus just became unraveled. He was self-controlled, so I don't mean by unraveled, but he was upset. He protested for the right reason, for the right reason. He didn't use that protest or that situation to protest against anything else, such as the rampant Jewish nationalism that existed, or the Roman occupation, the occupiers. He didn't protest against those things. He protested for the right reason. Number three, I want to talk about ulterior motives for a little bit. Can someone have another agenda other than the real purpose for the protest? Are you seeing that today? The peaceful protests that are going, I've seen videos, you've probably seen them. I wish I could show them to you here. I've seen videos of whites, whites spray painting BLM, George Floyd, BLM on buildings with black spray paint, white people. And I've seen these videos, they're on Instagram, they're all over the place, where you'll see black folk telling them, no, don't do that, because they're going to blame us for this. You've seen those videos? Raise your hand if you've seen those videos. You've seen those videos? Or this one where these two white guys are trying to bull down, tear down these, it's at night, tear down these, I don't remember what city it was, tear down these barriers that the police set up, but the police are standing right there. And this one black girl is trying to discourage them from doing that because they're going to blame us. And they're going to kill us. And you know what the response was? Well, they're going to kill you anyways. That's what the response was from one of those white guys in the masks. Who knows if they were Antifa or not? It's kind of hard to you know, pinpoint them down. But can you usurp a protest and take advantage because you have another agenda. Well, we saw that in these protests. Some of them were broke into the Fashion Square Mall and breaking the windows. And I've seen those videos where uh, black leaders are saying, this is wrong because that's not going to get us anywhere. So I'm not saying that blacks were not involved because you saw those videos where blacks did go into that pawn shop, you know, and kill the, the black uh, uh, retired uh, uh, captain there. You've seen those. Huh? So it's, 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 it's all a mixture. But you can protest for
for ulterior motives. And this is where I'm going to bring Acts 19 into play, as I mentioned earlier. The Ephesian businessmen protested against Paul. Why did they protest against Paul? Because Paul was cutting into their business. It was about money, as it usually is. It was about money. They were defending their, they were not so much defending their religious practices, but because they were losing the money, as Bruce correctly pointed out. But what was their, that was their real motive, but what did they pretend to say in that almost riotous mob that day in Ephesus? What were they saying, though, to the public? Oh, Diana, Diana, our goddess Diana, what's going to happen to her? What's going to happen to the temple? Like b putting all this pretended religious garb and concern about our goddess. That's a bunch of baloney. That was a lie. You're just concerned because you're going to lose money and you're going to become unemployed and you're going to have to go file for unemployment. That's what their, re <laughs> so, that's what their real protest was. But they just had ulterior motives. Revelation chapter 12. I'm not going to go deeply into this, but Lucifer's protest in heaven was not so much about the supposed unfairness and repression by God towards all heavenly beings. Now you have to read very carefully, and this is where you use some Hebrew tools, and this will help you to understand that in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel 28, the text says there that the king of Tyre, now by the time you know, that chapter 28 talks about king of Tyre and it, it, it talks about the literal king of Tyre, which was north of Israel. And then it goes into the spiritual king of Tyre, which we understand to be description of Satan. And it says there, talking about his trade, when it's talking about the spiritual king of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, talks about his trade, his corruption because of his trade. If you look at that Hebrew term there, it's a very interesting term because it has to do with gossip, malicious spreading of lies. And all, the Seventh-day Adventist church understanding of the great controversy between Christ and Satan is that Lucifer protested God's supposed um, monarchy and uh, tyranny and not allowing the heavenly angels to have absolute freedom. Um, you know, they didn't need God's laws after all because they were perfect beings. So why did they need God's laws? All of this gossip and this, and this fraudulent lies about God's character, that was Satan's protest in heaven until it finally ended in all-out war. And that's where Revelation 12 comes into play about the war in heaven. But his real motive was not fairness for everybody, was not equality. His real motive, the Bible says, he wanted the throne. He wanted the throne. He still wants the throne. He still wants to be enthroned in our hearts today. That's what we call sin, the sinful nature. Um, Daniel chapter 6, I mentioned this text. The palace high officials were not concerned for the king's reputation. Remember, they said, King, why didn't you make a law for 30 days? We want you, O king, to be the head honcho. We want, after all, it's, it's just, we want you, king, to be respected and to be loved by all the people. And so why don't you make a law stating that nobody is to pray to any of the other god or nothing except to you, king? Because after all, hey, you're the best. I mean, we're just so blessed. Thank the gods that you're here and that you are our king. I mean, they just buttered him up. They appealed to his ego. And that's what they said. What was their ulterior motive? What did they really want to do, according to Daniel 6? They were green with envy against Daniel, against impeccable Daniel, this foreigner, this captive of another race who climbed the ladder of success and position rapidly ahead of them. Here's a guy, another race, from another country, and he's ahead of us. We got shortchanged. They were jealous. And so they protested and packaged it one way, but underneath, 
they were really after something else. Just like we've seen on the news. These people that are really not for BLM, they just want to go and get these $300 Nike shoes out of the Fashion Square Mall. Just want to graffiti and do this. If you really want to protest for the right reasons, and if you really want to defend the African American race, then do it in the right way. Do it in a respectful way. Talk to the blacks themselves and ask them, what would you have us do? Because after all, this is about you guys and justice and racial equality for you, right? And usurping it to vandalize and to set a policeman on fire. Did any of you see that video? It's happened in Guadalajara, Mexico. This policeman was on his motorcycle. He's getting on his motorcycle and two guys are quickly, there's a mob all around them, quickly. A water bottle full of flammable fluid just psh, psh, lit the policeman on fire. Luckily, the other policeman tackled him and, you know, they, they put out the fire. Come on. I would, I think Martin Luther King Jr. is turning in his grave because of this, some of the things that are being done today. I'm going to get to that. Number, and here's another point that I have. Start at the right place. Now, this one is not always successful. I get it. But start at the right place. In other words, take your protest to the one who needs to hear it the most. To the oppressor. To the person or organization responsible for the injustice. To the guilty one. And this is where I bring up Matthew chapter 18. Jesus says, if you see somebody sinning, wrongdoing, what does Jesus say? Go to him or her. Go to that person. Don't start doing other things. No, go to that person. Now, what we're seeing here is more than just the person. It's a whole organization. It's, it's an establishment. And so it's a little bit more complex. But I think the principle holds true. Go to that person. This can be done in person if possible or in writing. Um, I've written a few emails this week myself. But using the right channels, uh, you know, go to the right person. It's not always going to work. You can be dismissed continually until frustration, discouragement, and even anger sets in. I think that's the plight of many people today, where people are just not listened to. You're not listened to. You're not listened to. You're not listened to. And as human nature goes, you're going to get angry. You're going to get upset. And you're going to start doing things of a violent nature. Um, I think we can understand the frustration. I wouldn't excuse violence, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's been like this for years. When are people going to listen? When are things going to change? So you can understand how some people can get upset. Think about arguments with your own spouse. Some of you may not have spouses anymore because of divisive nature of the relationship. Think about those arguments. They go both ways. He never listens to me. I'm so fed up. She never listens to me. I'm so fed up. And when that fed up is just becoming more and more and more and more, if you don't deal with things constructively, you're going to lash out and say and do things that you're going to regret. It's hard to put a cap on those things. I understand that. I got this quote. I, didn't, I forgot to put the source. Quote, when people feel helpless, like there is nothing left to lose, like their lives already hang in the balance, a wild, swirling, undirected rage is a logical result. I did put it. The New York Times columnist Charles Blow said, quote, you destroy people's prospect, you destroy people's prospects, they'll destroy your property. Well, that's what some people are doing. But again, we have to be careful not to bunch everyone in the same basket and say all whites are like this, or all blacks are like this. They're all doing this, they're all doing that. You have to be careful. And when emotions are so high and so charged as we are seeing today, it can easily get out of hand. That's why I mentioned that story in Acts chapter 19 in Ephesus. 
things were just about to get out of hand. Some people were yelling one thing, other people were yelling another thing in the theater, hundreds of people, and there was a riot just about to start. And some wise person said, let's be careful, because if what these apostles, if these guys, of what they're saying is true, then, you know, it's true, but if what they're saying is false, then don't worry about your business. Some wise words. And number five, this is the last one, never use your protest, your disagreement, for harming others or property, nonviolence. Mahatma Gandhi protested against English occupation, against the injustices in his day. Later came Martin Luther King Jr., who was inspired by Gandhi. And you've seen those peaceful marches in the streets. Of course, there were protests and burnings being built when Martin Luther King was assassinated, and people were angry because of that. But Martin Luther King Jr. emphasized peaceful protests. Peaceful protests. I saw video, original video footage from the 60s of people being interviewed and this young uh, black family, these young kids in this black family and the reporter goes and interviews them. And I think Dan Rather is in this, or one of those famous reporters back in the 60s. Amazing the things that were said. I downloaded like three or four Martin Luther King Jr. videos of his speeches. And one of those speeches, in fact, it's this famous speech, I can't remember what it was called, where he says, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. That famous speech. I don't remember the title of that speech, but in that same speech, I have a dream. In that same speech, I'm, I, I think I'm correct, in that same speech, he says, resulting in a huge applause, he says that black supremacy is just as dangerous as white supremacy. Which is just as dangerous as Filipino supremacy, Mexican-American supremacy, Mexican supremacy, uh, Latin American supremacy, Iraqi supremacy. Any type of race supremacy over another's is a dangerous one. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. espoused. Nonviolence. That was his philosophy and practice. The greatest protest, I want to finish on a spiritual note now. What is the greatest protest we need to be engaged in today? The greatest protest we need to be engaged in today. I want to share with you my heartfelt thoughts on this one. It's against hatred and prejudice and indifference. We have to protest against those tendencies in the human heart. That's the greatest protest. We humans are the best practitioners with years of experience and expertise, as I pointed out this morning, of seeing each other as our own enemies. Humans against humans. Humans of one race see humans of another race as inferior or as dangerous or as animals because of the differentness between races and cultures it is probably rare that no race is not guilty of this. I think we can all agree, all of us agree, that what we saw on that very sad day, that day that expresses, I can't breathe with the knee against the neck, I think we can all agree that that was unjust, that the uh, murder sentence is correct, I think we can agree with that. But our tendency as human beings, we always, always go too far in one sense or another. And this is what I mean. You cannot say that all African Americans or all Latinos or all 
white trash, trailer trash, what they call, I'm using culture terms, are evil or criminals. You can't say that. Neither can you say that all police, that all police officers are what they're saying, the acronym ACAB. All cops are bastards. That's what some of the graffiti that you'll find here or there. You can't say that. Not all cops are racist or are evil. You can't say that. And that is the concern that I have. The systemic racism against certain races, in this context, African Americans. But you cannot go too far on the other end and say, all cops are evil. All cops are bad. There's a lot of good cops out there. I would say the majority of them are good cops. It's true that reformation needs to take place in the police community. It's true that the police unions probably protect too much the bad cops in the system, and that needs to be reformed. That's true. But the protest that we need to be engaged in is we need to fight against our human tendency to not love others. And this is what Jesus warned us about in the last days. He said, because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many, in some manuscripts it says most, will grow what? Cold. Of all of these things that are, we are seeing, it's going to be easy to give up and to be disgusted, and I wish I was a hermit, I'm disgusted with people, we have to fight against that. And we have to fight the good fight and say we need to love people. We need to see all people as equal in God's eyes. Last week I said all lives matter. And some people may cringe at that because that's a politically charged statement. But I said it in the context of what Jesus says. There's no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's no female or male, no this race or that race, no free or slave. All are one in Jesus Christ. We, as humanity, we have to maintain sanity in our sights and in our hearts and not to lash out against other human beings Bunching them all in the same basket. We have to love others. And I'm going to go a step farther because Jesus goes a step farther. And this is going to go against the grain, especially of what is we are seeing today. The only solution for this madness that we're seeing today is Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes farther. He says, love your enemies. So my message, my message is that whites need to love black people. My message is that blacks need to love white people. My message is that who cares whether you're black or Latin, or white, who cares? We need to love others. And when others do us wrong, Jesus says we need to love our enemies. We need to love our enemies. The foundational protest we should be engaged in is the one against the primitive, base, animalistic virus that exists in the human heart that I'm better than you. That's the number one protest. The Bible says it correctly. There are battles against flesh and blood. That's true. But the real battle, the Bible says, is not against flesh and blood. It's against spiritualities. It's against those spiritual powers, the dark forces that are unseen, that subtly 
and cunningly enter our sights, our thoughts, and our hearts and will pit us against another human being. That has got to stop. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of sanity, we need to learn how to love each other simply because you're a human being. And to say to the Floyd family, love those who killed your brother, your nephew, your son. Do you know how many millions, if I were to post that in social media, I would be massacred to say something like that. Would you agree? I would be massacred. But I'm not saying it. Jesus is saying to those bad cops out there, you got to change your ways and you got to love others. And Jesus is saying to those Crips and those bloods, I grew up in L.A. I grew up in L.A. Not too far from central, L, uh, you know, Inglewood and Watts and Compton. Jesus would probably say to the Crips, you got to love the bloods because they're human beings. He'd say to the bloods the same thing. He would say to those hundreds of Latino gangs in L.A., you got to love each other. Even though you consider them your, your enemy, you got to love each other. Even in my own subculture, Mexican Americans have prejudice against the Mexican culture from Mexico. You may not believe it, but that's the truth. And vice versa. The same message of Scripture is that God loves people. Jesus died. For everyone. He died for George Floyd. He died for, what's his name? You told me his name this morning. The cop that killed him. Derek Chavon. Jesus died for Derek Chavon. How many of you agree with that? How many of you agree that Jesus died for George Floyd? How many of you agree that Jesus died for those who looted the, the mall in Scottsdale? Those that broke the windows. You think Jesus died for them? Jesus died for them too. He loves them. You think Jesus died for the organizers of, of Black Lives Matter? Yes. Jesus died for everyone so that we can all come together in unity in the name of love. We may disagree on points. That's always going to happen. But it's insanity that humans are against humans. That's not the way God meant it to be. This is the main protest. The protest against the sinful nature to put self first and to pit my race above your race, my ways above your ways, American ways above Mexican ways, Mexican ways above American ways, German ways above Italian ways, Spanish ways above Portuguese ways, Portugal ways. When I was in the seminary back in the early 90s, I experienced prejudice. We remember this very well. We experienced prejudice. It wasn't against Mexican Americans against Mexican Americans or other races. I was really shocked by this. We experienced prejudice from African Americans against African Africans. The same that I said earlier. Mexican Americans that grew up in this culture, like me, I am Americanized Latino. The same prejudice they have against those straight out of Mexico. Those racisms exist within the same race. Can't have this. Whites against whites. Whites killing whites. In the Civil War, we saw that. The Civil War wasn't all black soldiers fighting against all white soldiers. There were white soldiers killing other white soldiers because they disagreed over slavery. Rwandan genocide, the same thing. Hutus murdered between 500,000 and a million Tutsis. Rwandans killing Rwandans. 
Bosnians killing Bosnians, the ethnic cleansing of Muslims from 1992 to 1995 when Serb military forces massacred thousands. Insanity. The only sanity in this world is the message of the love of God for the human race and to love our neighbor as ourself. Jesus crossed the boundaries when he gave that parable to the Jews, to the Jewish crowd that day. That there was this man that showed compassion on a man that was half dead and beaten and robbed on the road. And one of you Jewish people, a Levite and a priest, saw him and passed by on the other road. The Jewish crossed the, Jesus crossed the line by saying this. The man that helped that man was a Samaritan. These hybrid monsters. And Jesus lifted up this foreigner, this Samaritan that said he was the one that was the true neighbor. Those are fighting words in Jewish for Jewish ears. This ludicrousy that we see of racism and prejudice. All human beings, all human beings are equal in God's eyes. Jesus died for all people, all people, even the ones that you don't like, even the ones that you and I may hate. Jesus loves them. That's the only sane message in our world today. And the protest that we need to do is a positive one. The protest against the hatred that exists in the human heart and promote love for humanity. That's what we need to be engaged in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for the light and the sanity and the power and the truth that your word gives to us. Help us not to forget this. In these times where anger and disgust and violence same thing in Noah's day. In these days, God, help us not to lose our spiritual moorings, to be firmly planted in the gospel of truth, the gospel of love. God, we want you to be in our hearts, that your love will be the light of our lives. And help us to love others as you have loved us. Help us to forgive others as you have forgiven my own sins. Help us to minister to others regardless of looks, appearance, race, as you minister to us, Jesus. Help us to reflect you in this crazy world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. We're not going to sing a closing hymn. Our deacons will come and usher you out. Remember, our offerings will be collected at the end. Today is the last day. Well, our offering drive through Daniel, <laughs> is taking place now. But God bless you, and may you live the light of God's love in your life this week until we meet again next Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.